more than my pleasure. Once again, God has blessed us to be able to come back and share a lesson with you. Uh, and today, as we continue through the Bible in one year, our lesson will be coming out the Gospel of St. Luke. We've now gotten over into the New Testament, and now we're going through Matthew, we're going through Mark, and now we're in the book of Luke. And we'll see what the book of Luke says for us or offers to us today in our lesson. Bow with me as we go before the Lord, before the Lord in a word of prayer, before we get started. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you for this beautiful day that you have allowed our eyes to see. Thank you for the things that our ears hear, Lord. And we thank you always for being able to move and have the activities of our limbs and a good mind on Heavenly Father. That we may be able to see and comprehend and do the things, O oh Lord, as we need to do as we go through this day. Bless us always, O oh Lord, with understanding. Help us to grow more into the likeness of Christ every day and every time we have the opportunity to study your word and hear your word. And we just thank you, Lord, for being good to us. Bless us each and every day and hold us in that power of the hands and praying also that we would grow into the likeness of Christ each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our lesson today, as we say, will be coming from the Gospel of St. Luke. It will be coming from the 27th, 22nd chapter, the 7th through the 23rd verse. And our lesson today is Luke's, the Lord's Supper. So we'll be talking about uh, the Holy Communion, because last week, we were, if you remember in our lesson, uh, Jesus was making his triumphant entry uh, into Jerusalem for the final time before his death. And this week he's there and he'll be celebrating the Passover with the disciples. But he's going to do uh, uh, something a little bit different this time with the Passover that he hadn't done previously. And one of the things he's going to be doing, he's going to be instituting what we call the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion. And one of the questions that I wanted to raise before we get into uh, uh, this lesson is communion. We take communion as Christians, whatever that schedule is for us to do something do it once a month, so maybe do it a little bit differently. But when we do take it, we have two elements, the bread and the wine. And generally, we always take the bread before we drink the wine. The question is, why do we do that? What is the reason behind why the bread always must precede the drinking of the wine? Think about that, and hopefully when we get into this lesson, we'll be to clear that up for you as we go along. So let's get into our lesson. Like I said, we're coming out the 22nd chapter of, um, of uh, St. Luke. And like I said, last week, again, Jesus was making his triumphant entry in. But we're going to see the difference what one week can make. Last week, people were praising him, saying, Hosanna, calling him the son of David, and really was high up on Jesus. Now, basically, one week later, later we're going to see that things have started to change. And now Jesus must go to the cross for us because he knew coming in what was going to happen. But uh, being the God and the person that Jesus was, he followed through and was obedient to the Father's uh, plan and Father's directive and what, uh, what the Father wanted him to do. And that's why it always is uh, becoming of us that likewise to be obedient as Christ was. Even though we may understand the circumstances may not always be what we want to see, it's still a part of what God wants us to do. So Jesus was obedient. So he's headed toward, he's in Jerusalem now. He's preparing to eat the, eat the Passover. And uh, let's see what happens as we get into the 22nd chapter of, of uh, Luke. A little bit about Luke here, so though, but Luke was a physician. He writes with the compassion and the warmth of a family doctor as he carefully documents the perfect humanity of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Luke emphasizes that Jesus' ancestry, birth, and the early life before moving carefully and chronologically through his earthly ministry. Growing belief and growing opposition develop side by side. Those who believe are challenged to count the cost of discipleship. Those who oppose will be, uh, won't be satisfied until the Son of Man hangs lifeless on the cross. But the resurrection ensures his purpose will be fulfilled to seek and to save that which is lost. So that's Luke's presence, uh, presentation of Christ uh, from, the, uh, from the physical side, from, from the side of, the, of being the son of man. Uh, and, and this is Luke, what Luke's gospel is, is, is circling around, or centered around as it talks about Jesus. So like I said, as our lesson opens up, uh, Jesus is going to give some instructions to two of his disciples. 
and helping them in, in preparing for the Passover because the Passover uh, certainly was one of the high feasts uh, in the, uh, the Jewish history. So as we look at this, like I said, we'll be going in, talking about the Passover and Jesus and them going into Jerusalem to do that. The Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacle were the three most important feasts of the Jewish calendar. We see that in Leviticus 23. And all the Jewish men were expected to go to Jerusalem each year to celebrate. You see that in Deuteronomy 6, 16 and 16. The feast of the Passover commemorated the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. And it was a time for both what remembering and rejoicing. And we see that in Exodus 11, uh, chapters 11 and 12. So they're heading up, Jesus is heading out for his final Passover, uh, one of the uh, three main feasts that the Jews celebrated each and every year. So it was required for, for, for Jewish men to go and, and Christ being Jewish, he followed the law, he did those things that was required of him as uh, a Jewish person. So let's get into our lesson. Uh, our lesson starts at verse seven, but I want to back up because now Jesus is going through the earthly ministry. Like I said, he's in Jerusalem now for the final time. And now uh, he's preparing to go to the cross. But there is one last thing that he needs to do with his disciples, uh, which is to institute the Lord's Supper with them. He's taught them for approximately three years or so now. And now it was time for him to move on because what he had come to do, he had fulfilled in bringing men out, developing them, and giving them what they need to move forward. Of course, they still yet needed one more thing, which was the Holy Spirit filling their lives. But the teachings and, and, and the things that Christ helped them to see why he was here uh, was fulfilled. And now it's time for him to move on. So now let's start back at verse 1 in chapter 2, 22. And let's see how this thing unfolds before we get to the upper room. It says, Now the feast of the unleavened bread, verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 1, now the feast of the unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, Jesus, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains uh, how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenant to give him money. And he promised and saw opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. So now this is what used to happen in the situation. Uh, basically, the fall of any empire or any organization or any government or any business or anything usually happens on the inside uh, for somebody from inside because they are the ones who have the information and understand how to really bring that person or that company or that situation down because they have they have the information of the ins and outs of what goes on. So therefore, even though the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus, but because of the crowds in Jerusalem and because of what people thought about Jesus, they couldn't do that because they feared the people that there would be an uproar if they killed Jesus, that the people would turn back on them. So now what did they have to do to get rid of Jesus? They was able to get with Judas, as we see in those first six verses, and Judas was the inside man. And that's what uh, damages us a lot of time is the inside person who has the information on when and where how things go about. So he knew the time when Jesus were away from the crowds, away from uh, people, so that if the, the Sanhedrin and those Jewish leaders wanted to come get them, they could. So Judas' uh, position in this thing was to give them the information that they needed in order to get Jesus isolated and away from the crowd so that they could uh, go in and capture him and eventually kill Jesus. But listen to this. It is incredible that these men perpetrated history's greatest crime uh, during Israel's most holy festival. During Passover, the Jews were expected to remove all leaven and yeast from their houses as a reminder of their ancestors left Egypt in haste and had to eat unleavened bread, unleavened bread. Now, that, that's something to think about. One of the most specialist days in the Jewish history, and the only thing men can think about was destruction and death. And, and it goes to show when a person's mind is so made up to do what they want to do, they're going to do it irregardless of what the situation or the circumstances, as long as it fulfills their agenda, 
they're going to do it. But now the, the sad thing about this is these are the religious leaders. These are the ones who should be upholding the holy day, upholding the feast day, doing those things that God would have them to do. But yet they're doing just the opposite. They're doing and creating their own agenda and trying to find an opportunity to kill Jesus away from the people. So we see where the hearts and the minds of the Jewish leaders were. But now let's also look at the other person who's involved in this, which is Judas. And let's look and see where his heart and mind were. Judas, listen to this, was motivated and energized by Satan. We see it in John 3, 13, 2, and then 27. For he never was a true believer in Jesus Christ. His sins had never been cleansed by the Lord. We see that in John 13, 11, 10, and 11. He had never believed and received eternal life. Yet none of the other apostles had the least suspicion that Judas was a traitor. We have every reason to believe that Judas had been given the same authority as the other men and that he had preached the same message and performed the same miracles um, as it is shown how close a person can come to God's kingdom and still be lost. So that's why I said we can't get too excited or over overzealous about somebody in the church. Because just like I say, just because you're in the church and you got certain positions and you do certain things, don't mean you have the power of God or the spirit of God in your life. Uh, why people do it, and we we understand Judas's position right now. Judas was uh, uh, a thief, as the Bible says, and Judas always looked for opportunity to gain. And right now, he saw the opportunity to gain uh, from Jesus uh, because of the fact that uh, he would, he, he, Jesus was going away. He had the opportunity uh, presented to him by the Sanhedrin Council, and Jesus and Judas saw an opportunity to gain money because of his greed. And that's why I say sometimes our own selfish desires. And some, uh, sometimes our own selfish motives takes us in a direction that we don't need to go. And we see this clearly with Judas. Here Judas has, has, has eaten, sleeping, like you say, no doubt, given the same power that the other disciples did everything that everybody did and talked with Jesus, right there with Jesus throughout these three years of ministry. But yet, he was still not part of the, uh, of the fold. And that's why I say, don't get confused about people in the church or what people say or do. It, the fruit, uh, like Christ said, the tree is known by the fruit it bears. Just look at the fruits of what people do and how they live, and that would tell you all they need to do. But the interesting thing is, is this, why did Jesus, I mean, why did Judas betray Jesus? We know that he was a thief and that the money played a part in a terrible deed. But 30 pieces of silver was not a large payment for a great crime, and there had been something, there had to be something more involved. It was possibly that Judas saw in Jesus the salvation of the Jewish nation, and therefore he followed him because he hoped to hold an office in the kingdom. Keep in mind the 12 often argued uh, over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom, and Judas the treasurer surely participated in those important discussions. When Judas understood that Jesus would not establish his kingdom, but rather surrender to the authorities, he turned against him in bill of retaliation. Okay, so we see now that Jesus, Judas was saying is this, is that, well, if Jesus ain't going to really be nothing, why do I need to follow him? Maybe, maybe I can gain something out of this. And again, sometimes it's just really amazing with the minds and hearts of people are when they do different things, because generally, especially in this world today, anything and most things are just basically motivated by, by like, as Christ said, the love of money. It's got to be something about money behind everything that happens uh, that motivates companies and people and, and, and situations to happen uh, that continuously happen each and every day. So Judas did it because he was the Judas did it because he saw opportunity. Why he would betray Jesus, uh, even though whether he thought he was the son of God or not, he saw opportunity, and because of his greed and his lust, it caused him to do things in a different way. So that's the first six verses that sets up what is about to happen in our lesson. We start at verse 7. Let's get into verse 7. It says, And then came the day of the unleavened bread, uh, when the Passover must be killed. Now, unleavened bread, the annual commemoration of the Passover is conjoined with and sometimes referred to as 
the feast of the unleavened bread. Uh, the avoidance of, of a leaven symbolizes the haste of the unforgettable night of the Exodus. In the context of this message, the word Passover is used either of the meal, the feast day, or the whole eight-day period of celebration. So it's not necessarily specifically talking about the night when uh, the uh, Jewish people had to get up out of Egypt and leave in haste. That's why they didn't want to put leaven, which is something that causes the bread to rise. They ate it without the rise, and so they eat and get out because they had to eat their Passover meal before they left Egypt, before the death angel came and killed all the firstborn in Egypt. So that's the reason for that. But So we're talking about the celebration. So the day of the, of the unloved bread or the celebration when the Passover must be killed or the lamb must be killed. And this is the instruction what Jesus gave to James, uh, Peter, and John. Verse 8 and 9. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us uh, the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where well, thou that we may prepare? Now we see that, uh, uh, again, Jesus kept in line with all the Jewish holidays and tradition because the law was still in effect when he came. He still was a Jewish person. So therefore, he still had to conform to all those things uh, that the law prescribed for him to do. But look at the interesting thing here. He came to Peter and John. Uh, the way our Lord uh, arranged for the Passover feast indicates that he knew that there was a plot afoot. Until the disciples arrived at the upper room, only Jesus, Peter, and John had knowledge of where the feast would be held. Now the question is why? Possibly looking at this. Had Judas known, he might have what? Tempted to inform what the authorities. Remember now, verse 1 through 6, Help us to understand that the authority, the Jewish authority, was looking for an opportunity to get Jesus away from the people uh, so they could come in and arrest him and eventually kill him. And so Judas, as we look back, was the person who was supposed to give them that information so that they could come in and do what they had to do. So Jesus only tells Peter and John about what he wants to do because not only was this the last time that he was going to eat the Passover with the disciples, but it also was going to be a special time because he was going to institute something new and different, which we call the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion uh, in this last setting. And this was something he had to do with his disciples, help them understand uh, everything about what his whole mission and, and what his whole life was all about and what it was wrapped up in in the, in the body and the bread, uh, uh, in, the, in the bread and the wine, I should say, uh, that they was about to partake of and give new meaning to what it means to eat and drink those things. Verse 10, and he said unto them, Behold, you are entered into the city, and there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him unto the house where he entereth, in 11 and 12 and 13. And you shall say unto the good man of the house, The master said unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished they make ready. And they went and found as he just said and said to them, uh, and they made ready the Passover. So now we see in Jesus uh, sending James, I mean Peter and John to prepare uh, the Passover. Peter and John would have no trouble locating the man because look at the instructions he told them. Go find a man uh, in verse 10. He said, well, you see, in this city, when you see a man bearing pitchers of water, listen to this. The man uh, they would have no problem locating the man with the water pitcher because men rarely carried pitchers of water. This was the task of women, like the men who own, like the man who owned the ass and the coat in Luke 19, 28, and 30. This anonymous man was a disciple of Jesus who made his house available to the master for the last Passover. And like I can say, anytime the Spirit leads you to do something, do it. Why? Because just like this situation here, we look at Jesus knows everything before it happens. So again, why don't we trust God fully in all that we do when he's leading us in a direction to do something? Jesus gave them exact description, exact directions, and exact commands as to what to do and what they would find. And they went around and found exactly as Jesus had said with the man carrying the water pots. And like I said, this is an unusual thing for men to do. But... Um, uh, they found him, 
And they did what Jesus said. And the man, and listen what he said. And he said, show you a large upper room furnished, make it ready. So again, um, Jesus already understood what was happening. The man understood what was happening. And, uh, and, 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 and it made everything flow so well because, like I say, God had all this in his plan. Let's back up to verse 11. And he said, say unto the good man of the house, the master said unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Now, the word good man in the house, which refers to the house or the supervisor or the master of the house, who should show them uh, a pre-prepared upstairs room. So Jesus already knew what was going to happen, already knew what was there. And then, like I said, for the sake of the situation, the man didn't argue with him. Once they told him, he said uh, that the master needs, needs use of it, just like it was last week, the code. All they had to do is tell the person what Jesus told them, and everything was okay. And we see that right here in the same situation. Because why? God works out everything for us. If we just be obedient and follow what God has for us to do, we can see that God makes everything fall into place. And then it, it went on in verse 12 saying, he said, and verse 12 says this, that he show you a large room uh, furnished and therefore make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they make ready for the Passover. So again, if we just follow what Jesus says, everything works out okay. And like I say, Jesus not only prepared Peter and John, but he also prepared what? The, the supervisor or the head of the house in order for what they was going to say that he would be right there, uh, ready to give them the upper room as he wanted. <clears throat> Peter and John would purchase uh, and approve. This is what happens for, for the Passover. Peter and John would purchase an approved lamb and take it to the temple to be slain. Then they would take the lamb and the other elements of the supper to the house where they had planned to meet, and, they, and there the lamb would be roasted. The table would be furnished with wine, unleavened bread, and a paste of bitter herbs, they remind the Jews of that long journey and bitter bondage in Egypt. We can see that in Exodus 12, 1 through 28. So everything that that that, that they were that was in the in the prescribed in the law and what it was necessary to do on that first night back in Egypt, God they're also still celebrating it several hundreds of years down the line now. And this is what uh Peter and John got together and prepared the meal of the Passover. So they're in the upper room now, everything is set. And now let's see what happens. Verse 14 through 16. And when the hour was come, he sat down with his 12 disciples with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now let's read verse 15 in the New Living Translation. This is what it says. Jesus said, I have been eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering. That's what he says, I desire, uh, desire to eat this Passover. And then verse 16 says, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom uh, of God. The disciples did not know what to expect as they met in the upper room, but it turned out to be an evening of painful revelation. Jesus, the host of the supper, met them uh, with the traditional kiss of peace. He kissed Judas as well. And then the men reclined around the table. And we can see that in verse 14 when he says, when the hour had come, he sat down with them and the 12 disciples with him. And I want to read a little bit of a passage of scripture here. In verse 14, it's, and listen to this. At this solemn gathering, Luke refers to disciples as apostles. They had completed their period of apprenticeship. And here at the Last Supper, they received Christ's final instructions and message for the entire world. The phrase, I have desired, I have desired, this Passover expresses the intense eagerness with Jesus was approaching this particular Passover before his passion or suffering. It was the utmost importance that his disciples understood the full significance of the approaching death of the true Passover towards which the commemoration looks. The phrase, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God, anticipates a heavenly banquet that Christ prepares for his bride. It also indicates Jesus' eagerness to have this party meal together with his closest friends, students, and followers in the ministry. Not even death can separate him from those he calls his own. So we see that, again, like I say, this was a very um, important meal for a lot of different reasons. First of all, this would be the last time 
but then also Jesus wanted to institute something new uh, in the form of the Lord's Supper. So therefore, uh, this was one of those times where Jesus had to be alone with his disciples and not allow anybody to come in here and mess this up, but do the things that they need to do. All right, verse 17 through 20. Listen to what it says. And it says that he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I will show, I will say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of wine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you, this you do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after the supper saying, this cup is the New Testament uh, in my blood, which is shed for you. And this is what, uh, and this goes back to our question when we let off. Why must um, the bread always precede the taking of the wine in communion? And if we look at what happened with Christ on the cross and what the bread represents, which is his body, the wine represents his blood. But what had to happen first in order for one to, to follow the other? The body hung on the cross, but how did the blood come out? Because the body had to be beaten and broken first before the blood came out. So why do we eat the two elements, bread first, wine first? Because the body represent, the bread represents the body, which had to be beaten and broken first before the blood can come out. So therefore we take the body first and then uh, drink, eat the bread first, and then we drink the wine, which represents his blood. And there's a reason why we do everything pretty much everything in our in our services and, and the things we do uh, because they represent things that the Bible teaches us how we believe that things should be enacted. And we enact the, the Holy Communion, which is one of the ordinances and one of the things that we do in the Christian church because we feel like it represents the blood and the body of Christ. So therefore, the body had to be beaten and broken first before the blood came out. That's why we take the bread first before we take the wine. Listen to this. Uh, Luke's account uh, reversed the normal order of, com of commemoration of the Passover meal. Ordinarily, at the outset of the meal, the head of the table would break the bread and offer thanks. And at the end of the meal, the head of the household also closed by saying grace after the meal and sharing the cup of blessing. At the Last Supper, Jesus offers thanks according and then breaks and offers the bread to his disciples. Um, as the head of his family, but more importantly, he asked the word, this is my body, which gave new meaning and significance uh, to the to the time on a, on a ritual. Here, Jesus is declaring that the deliverance commemorated by the feast of the Passover is fulfilled in his broken body. In the same manner, he takes the cup of the wine and gives a deeper meaning and significance as he declares it is now fulfilled the Old Testament and established the New Testament covenant. The shedding of blood is commonly associated with the ratification of a covenant. And what was written in that blood was believed to be symbolically indelible. The blood of mere animals established the Old Testament, but this New Testament established and ratified by the spotless blood of the Son of God. Jesus also wants his disciples to understand that his body is being given for them. And that's what we have to understand, that now Jesus is given a new meaning and a new understanding uh, to all that is going forth now. So that's why it was so important for them to understand this, this particular part of the ministry, what was happening to him, and the fellowship that we have with Christ through by coming together uh, and taking part in this holy, uh, what we call the Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. So this was one of those things, as we say, that could not and should not have been interrupted. That's why God didn't tell, Christ did not tell anybody else but Peter and John what his plans were, and everybody found out later on. <clears throat> so we have to understand um, that, um, that uh, we have to do those things that, that, uh, that, that needs to be done. Now, let's look at the three purposes of the supper. First of all, Jesus, the first purpose is, Jesus stated one of the purposes was to do it in remembrance of me. It is a memorial feast to remind the believers that Jesus Christ gave his body and blood for the redemption of the world. Secondly, 
The purpose is uh, the supper is the proclaiming of his death until he returns. The supper encourages us to look back with love and adoration to what he did for us on the cross and to look forward with hope and anticipation to his coming again. Since we must be careful not to come to the Lord's table with known sin in our lives, the supper should also be an occasion for looking within, examining our hearts, and confessing our sins. Third reason for the for the supper is that uh, a third blessing from the supper is reminder of the unity of the church. We are one loaf. Supper is not the exclusive property of any Christian denomination. Wherever we share the Lord's Supper, we are identifying with Christians everywhere. Are remind and are reminded of the obligation to keep the unity and the spirit in the bonds of peace. So we should really, really uh, take the Lord's Supper very highly and very uh, uh, and look at it as being very special. Simply because you know we go back over to Corinthians where Paul talks about it. You see, that's why there are a lot of people sick and and, and things going on among them because we eat it unworthily. We go in there and taking it. Lightly, you know, and we got sin and all kind of foolishness on us, and and we haven't repented. And then th th this is a serious situation when it comes to our relationship with God, and we should take it that way. And that's why Jesus had to sit down with his brethren and share this meal with them, this one last meal and this one last institution uh, that he gave to them before he passed away. So it is very important, and we must look at this each and every time that we are. Uh, we go forth and we take the supper. Now let's hurry to our close as we close this out. Verse 21 and 22. He said, but behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the son of man goes as it was determined, but warned to him that's betrayed him. Jesus predicts his betrayal and the fate of the one who will betray him. There has been a great deal of discussion about the fate of Jesus. Some suggest Judas could not help himself, and there is not blameworthy for betraying Jesus. If indeed Judas could not help him, help but to fulfill a task which he had specifically predestined by God, it would be unfair and unjust to punish him for it. But rather, the truth is that Judas was responsible for his own decision. Okay? It is true that Jesus knew from the beginning who should betray him. We see that in John 6, 64. But knowing does not always what cause does not mean causing. We must not be able to dis we must we may not be able to discern the motives rushing through the minds of Judas, but we can be fairly certain that greed and the love of money was involved. Judas could have chosen what not to betray the master. So the, the whole bottom line is we can we can argue the point whether Judas was. Because he was the son of perdition that was predicted, predicted that he would betray Jesus. But as the author is saying, even in our lives, no matter what happens, as long as we got the right mind and good sense to do something, we have the final decision on what we do. Did Jesus have to betray Jesus? Well, it was a part of God's plan. Something was going to happen to cause that to happen. But he still had the opportunity to come uh, not to do that. But even... Because he did betray Jesus, did he have not the opportunity to come back to God and repent of his sin? Absolutely. But did he do that? Like so many of us, we think that we have done something so wrong and so bad that we can't be forgiven. But that was not the case. Nowhere where you say that, that Judas couldn't have ever been forgiven for what had happened. Did Christ have to go to the cross? Did something have to happen uh, for that to be? Yeah, just so happened Judas was that person in that position to do that because of his greed and his lust. But again, take in mind what the author said, he still had the final decision not to do that if he chose not to. But because of his greed and his lust and his thirst for money and, and for 30 pieces of silver, like they say, which is a very small price to pay, he sacrificed his whole life for something that he didn't even use. He tried to give it back and they didn't even want it. And what, what wound up happening to Jews he went out and hung himself. And, and like I say, when we go from bad to worse in our lives and not come back to God as we should, that's where we contend to fall and never get the way we need to be. Could Jesus have been say, I really believe he could have if he could have come back and repented. But like many of us, our hearts are hard 
uh, our minds are, are, are set in a certain way, and uh, we always take the wrong path that takes us farther uh, into a situation that we can't get out of. And that's what happened to Judas. So Jesus knew, Judas knew, the other disciples didn't. But uh, again, it had to be, God's will had to be fulfilled. And this was, let's look at verse 23, and it says this, uh, and they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. It said, Jesus knew, and I can say he, and if you go back, early on, if you read the gospel, I think it's in John, like I say, 6, 64, uh, Jesus prayed about his uh, disciples, okay? Uh, and he prayed to God before he chose his men. But guess what? Judas was still part of that crowd uh, because there had to be a fulfillment of God's plan. And because of Judas's own um, mindset, heart set, he fitted into the plan what God needed to help make that go forth as it should be. But we still have, like I say, the, the opportunity to not do something or to come back if we do. And that's what Judas failed to do. So everybody is now is trying to figure out who did it. The Greek phrase translated to inquire among themselves literally means to dispute to themselves and suggest some of some form of inquisition among disciples in an attempt to discover who the corporate was. Obviously, both Jesus and Judas knew who the betrayer was. Jesus' words were intended to arouse repentance in Judas, not to give occasion for self-righteousness chatter. It is important that today we receive and respond to Christ's word, not with a holier-than-thou attitude, but with the personal soul-searching and repentance. So we, 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 so this is a powerful, good lesson. And what I feel is a good takeaway from here is, is that we can't blame anybody else but ourselves for what we do. Yeah, we, we like, some of us like to follow the crowd. Some of us like to be part of the end thing or what's happening thing. But the bottom line, no matter what happens in your life, unless something is just out of your control, you control your destiny and what you do and what you say. So just like Judas, we don't have to do the things that we do, but if we do, and we all do fall short. What is the thing we shouldn't do? We shouldn't hang our head in, 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 in sadness, but we should come back to God and ask God to save us and to bring us back in. That's what we should do and not what Judas do, he did and went out and hang himself. So hopefully something has been said today that will help you. Uh, this is a good lesson. Go back and study it. Go back and look at it. Think about the things we said and, and pray that God will give you even, even more inspiration as you go back through it. And and this going through the Bible year does do a lot of great things for us till we get to see every book uh, in a year's time and kind of understand a little bit about every book. And it helps us in so many ways. But God bless you. God keep you. And until we have a blessed opportunity to meet again, thank you for this opportunity. God bless you. If you enjoy this program, call us right now, 404-688-6680, or send an email to info at mountpleasantatl.org. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church is a congregation full of life and love for everybody. Would you consider sowing an offering? Whatever God lays on your heart to give would be a blessing to the ministry. Thank you for your support. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia.